Connect 4 was a favorite game of mine when I was young. Players take turns dropping tokens into one of the columns, where they fall into place. The goal is to get four of your tokens in a row, either vertically, diagonally, or horizontally, and preventing your opponent from doing the same. Let's visualize the core Python code necessary to play Connect 4, featuring two-dimensional lists, four range loops, and functions. As the animated code runs, the variables will be tracked on the right. It takes quite a bit of code to program a game, and defining functions like make board on line 1 is important to staying organized. Make board has two input parameters and one output. Line 7 defines the add token function to have three input parameters and no outputs, that is, there are no values or variables after the return statements. Defining those two functions essentially puts the code aside for later. Line 16 is where we actually call a function, telling Python to run the make board code using 7 and 6 as the two inputs. This is the traditional size of the connect4 board. Python creates a new variable scope to hold the variables in this function call, starting with the two parameters width and height. The board will be a two-dimensional list, that is, a list containing other lists which contain strings representing the pieces of the game. To make a two-dimensional list, we start with a normal empty list on line 2, using a pair of empty square brackets, and save it to a variable b, short for board. The for range loop on line 3 will repeat line 4 a number of times equal to the height parameter variable. This is achieved by expanding the range 0, 6 into effectively a list of numbers from 0 through 5 inclusive, and then iterating the row variable through those numbers. Line 4 might look a little strange. The square brackets say to make a list with a single space character inside, but then why are we multiplying a list by an integer? Python interprets the multiplication by 7 as repeating the contents of the list 7 times. That is, we make a full row of strings that represent no player tokens being there yet. The append method adds this new list to the existing b list, creating a new row in the two-dimensional board. Because of the for loop, line 4 repeats until all rows are added to the board list. The return statement on line 5 returns the list as the output of the function. One technical note is that the contents of lists are not copied when passed out of or into functions. What is copied is something called a reference, which I visualize as an arrow to the contents of the list. This is why we briefly have two arrows to the B list. One reference is returned, and the other goes away with the other variables in the makeboard variable scope because the function finishes and Python frees up computer memory. This returned list reference is then stored to the game board variable because of the single equal sign on line 16. Now to add player tokens to this empty board. Remember that a token will fall in from the top and either land on the bottom of the board or some existing tokens. The code in the add token function needs to emulate that behavior. Line 17 calls the add token function to simulate the green or G player putting a token in the third column, that is column index 2 because Python lists start counting at zero. The code in the function starts after all the parameters are copied into the function. The variable col, or call, is shorthand for column. The if statement on line 8 asks if the top row of the chosen column is full. Notice this syntax has two sets of square brackets. To get an item out of a two-dimensional list, we first specify the name of the list, in this case, board. Second, the left set of square brackets select the row, in this case, the top row. Then, the right set of square brackets retrieves a specific item out of that row, using the integer 2 in the call variable as the index. The condition evaluates to false because the column is not full, so Python skips line 9 and moves on to the for loop on line 10, which will try to drop the player's tokens onto other tokens by repeating lines 11 through 13. Before expanding the range, Python evaluates this inner len function to count how many rows are in the board. There are currently six rows, but this function will work for any positive number of rows. Notice the range starts at 1 because we already checked if row 0 was full on line 8. The condition on line 11 is checking for a non-empty cell. 
the leftmost brackets are evaluated first, followed by the rightmost brackets. Put another way, two-dimensional lists are accessed by row first, then by column. I remember this row, then column order because I was a fan of remote control or RC toys when I was growing up. RC, row column. Anyway, we the humans know that the board is empty, so there are no tokens to land on top of, thus we can fast forward to the end of the loop. The loop did not find any existing tokens in the column index 2, so line 14 puts the G token on the bottom row. The single equal sign operator takes the player variable from the right and saves it to the row and column of the two-dimensional board list on the left. Notice the row variable still has the last value from the range, a 5, which is the index of the bottom row. Python has reached the end of the function. There's not an explicit return statement, but Python pretends there is one, and the function completes with no output value to return. When the blue or B player places their token in column index 4, the code plays out very similarly. The key difference is that the call variable is 4 this time. The range expands to the same thing as before because the number of rows in the board has not changed. When the loop completes, again, unable to find an existing token in column index 4, the B token is placed in the bottom row for that column, and the code returns. Now the green player places a second token in column index 2. The if statement on line 8 is still false, because the entire column is not full. The first four iterations of the for range loop have line 11 also be false, because there are no tokens in the top five rows. Things change on the fifth iteration because row five, column two, is not a space, and the condition on line 11 is true. Line 12 subtracts one from the row variable inside the first set of square brackets, which has the effect of referring to the row above the cell with the existing token. Like before, the single equals sign updates the cell at that location, effectively putting one token on top of the existing token. The return on line 13 is very important because we want to stop trying to put the token anywhere else. A return inside a function will stop the function immediately, even if it's in the middle of a loop. Let's see one more example of putting a B token on top of a stack of existing tokens. When the for loop and conditional identify that row 4, column 2 has a token, line 12 puts the token in row 3, column 2. The return statement immediately stops the function. To help explain the functions which try to find a winner, imagine several more turns progress. This code looks complex, but conceptually it looks for four of the same tokens in a row horizontally, and if it doesn't find that, it slides over one column and looks again and again, and eventually resets for the next row until all possible spots have been searched. If it finds a horizontal four in a row, the corresponding player token is returned as the winner. To see the details play out, imagine someone has called the winner horizontal function with this board, which Python stores to the B variable. 
The function consists of two nested for loops. The outer for loop will go through all possible values of row, which for this board is 0 through 5 inclusive. The inner for loop will go through all possible column values. We have seven total columns, but we'll skip checking the last three columns for a reason I will come back to later. Columns 0 through 3 inclusive will be sufficient. The if statement on line 24 checks if the item corresponding to the row and call variables is a space. Because that item is a space, we know the player does not have a for in a row horizontally here. Thus, the code uses a continue statement to tell the inner call loop to skip to the next value, effectively shifting the search area one square to the right. Soon, the inner for loop on line 23 ends, having checked all columns in the top row, and the outer for loop on line 22 goes to the next value, continuing the search on the second row, that is, row index 1. Python restarts the inner for loop on line 23, even recomputing the length of the row before expanding the range. We, the humans, know that the board is a rectangle, but Python cannot know that without measuring. We, the humans, can also see that row index 1 is empty, so let's fast forward the animation until we get to something interesting in row index 2. The current item at row 2, column 2 is a non space string, so the condition on line 24 is false and line 25 is skipped. Line 26 has another if statement with a multi part condition spread across multiple lines using these parentheses. The only code inside the if statement is line 29. Lines 26, 27, and 28 are just the questions the if statement is asking. Python first evaluates the question on line 26, which asks if the current item at row 2, call 2 is the same as the item next to it at row 2, call 3, using the double equals operator to do this comparison. These happen to be the same, so the first part of the condition is true. The AND at the end of line 26 will join this true with the question from line 27, which compares the current item to the item two positions to the right at row two, call four. These are not the same, so the double equals operator evaluates to false. Python now does a clever optimization, because this condition is a chain of questions joined by AND operators, and a single link in the AND chain is false, the whole condition is known to be false. The optimization of skipping questions like this is called short circuit evaluation, it is useful for writing concise code. Anyway, the condition being false means Python skips line 29, so it goes back up and advances the call loop variable. At row 2, call 3, we see another case of short circuit evaluation because the first question in the AND chain is false, so Python concludes that the whole chain is false and again skips line 29. The end of the inner call loop means it's time to advance the outer row loop, taking us to the fourth row, or row index 3. After using continue to skip the first column, Python now gets to row 3, call 1, where we the humans can see a 4 in a row. Via the three conditions on line 26, 27, and 28 that ask if the four items next to each other are all the same, Python is also able to see the four in a row horizontally. Because the if statement on line 26 is true, line 29 runs, which returns the current item at row 3, call 1, corresponding to the player who won. Like before, the return statement immediately stops the function, even though both loops had not yet reached the end of their ranges. Before moving on, I want to come back to this important but subtle minus 3 in the call range of the inner for loop. Suppose the minus 3 did not exist. What would break? Pause the video and identify where the code might crash. Conceptually, the inner loop slides a window of four horizontal cells across the board and asks if they are all the same. Without the minus three, the sliding window would go off the board and Python could crash trying to access items past the end of the list. Because we are looking up to three columns ahead of the call loop variable, we should stop the loop three columns early to avoid this. 
thus the minus 3 in the range. There are three other directions to check for four player tokens in a row, but thankfully the code is similar. To find vertical wins, the sliding search window still slides to the right and then down to the next row, and eventually the next row, and so on. The key change to make the search window be vertical is to change the column offsets to be row offsets. Additionally, the minus three in the call range needs to be moved to the row range so the sliding window does not go past the bottom of the board. In this example board, there is no vertical winner, so both for loops on line 33 and 34 will complete, and the return on line 41 will return a space to indicate that no player won vertically. The function to handle diagonal winners down into the right basically combines the horizontal and vertical code. Both the row and call variables have an offset now, and we stop both loops three items from the end to avoid overflow. The other diagonal direction, down and to the left, is similar but different. The down part is the same in that we look for increasing rows and stop three rows from the bottom, but to go left, we look at decreasing column values using subtraction instead of addition. Notice also how the inner loop starts at column index three and goes all the way to the last column. The search window extends to the left, so it needs to start shifted right to avoid incorrectly using negative indices. Those six functions make up the core of Connect4. If you wanted to implement the full version, you would need to add code to ask a user to type in a column, be sure to check for valid integers and non-full columns, use a loop to repeatedly switch between the players, ask for input, add the tokens to the board, and then check for winners, and then that loop will keep doing that over and over till the end of the game. Building programs that do things you find interesting is a great way to practice and develop your skills. Happy learning!